Good morning, Spinnaker Summit, and welcome to the Advanced Spinnaker Pipelines uh, workshop, uh, going over uh, advanced pipeline patterns and uh, how you can power them with uh, spring expression language. My name is Mark Noe, and I'll be the solutions architect uh, from Armory, who will be walking you through the presentation. So to get started, we'll give a little bit of background about myself, right? Like I said, my name is Mark. I've uh, been a solutions architect at Armory, uh, supporting enterprise uh, customers, implementing Spinnaker for about a year now. Uh, my background, I, I have a bachelor's in oceanography, so I didn't actually study computer science or anything close to it when I was in school. Uh, served in the Navy, drove ships, uh, finished up my time in the Navy working in the basement of the Pentagon, which is a whole series of stories. Um, but over the past 10 years, I've held a variety of roles in the software industry. Um, starting out as a software specialist, uh, became a trainer, uh, got into project management, um, both kind of traditional um, waterfall project management and then over into agile. Um, ended up then kind of continuing to work backwards in the process and got into full stack engineering, became an engineering lead. Now I'm a solutions architect. So variety of experiences um, and uh, really it's kind of put me in a good position to work with Spinnaker uh, with all the knowledge of kind of not only engineers are going to leverage the capability, but really the, the business value that it brings to enterprises. So as far as our workshop agenda goes, um, we'll be working through uh, a short slide deck. Just want to kind of level set on that. Uh, this is not death by PowerPoint. Um, we'll go through pipeline expression basics, uh, two quick slides, uh, pulling those from Armory's uh, training that I built. Um, really just a level set. Don't want to make any assumptions that everyone is just going to be able to read a pipeline expression. Um, then uh, even though this is really about advanced Spinnaker pipelines, to really understand kind of what I'm going to show you later in the pipeline examples, I uh, need to walk through a few slides that kind of go through some um, you know, lesser used uh, capabilities inside of Spring Expression Language that I leverage whenever I'm building uh, complex pipelines. So to start off, we'll kind of go through a little bit of pipeline expression basics. <clears throat> a pipeline expression, you know, as many of you may already know, allows you to access the data generated during a pipeline's execution, right? And it's using an expression syntax based on the spring expression language. I think uh, a lot of folks talk about uh, the, the query syntax, the search syntax of spring expression language in Spinnaker just as spell, but really inside of uh, Spinnaker, it's an implementation of spell uh, that really gives the pipeline expressions capability. So it's it's built on spell. It's not a direct implementation of spell. So not every feature of spell is available, but most of them are. Um, pipeline expressions can be used in most of the text fields of the pipeline stage. And if you don't see a pipeline text field, you can usually uh, just edit the pipeline JSON um, as, as needed using the edit as JSON for the pipeline. Um, pipeline expressions, I mean, the power becomes is that you can really evaluate the data as the pipeline is being executed to set dynamic variables, to find arbitrary values and perform basic calculations, and even leverage Boolean. Your pipeline based on its own state, you know, to, uh, you know, an outcome that you're looking to achieve. Uh, key points of usage, you know, we see a uh, people uh, accessing parameters uh, defined within the pipeline. A single point use case to maybe being able to use to deploy many applications. Uh, using the evaluate variable stage to conditionally trigger or terminate pipeline branches. And really the ability to even branch pipelines is powered by pip pipeline expressions. Turning on or off particular pipeline stages. And then of course, checking the status of a previous stage as well. Now, the basics of a pipeline expression is that it's made up of a dollar sign followed by an opening and closing bracket. That's what really tells Spinnaker, hey, this is, a, this is an expression that needs to be evaluated, evaluate it, and then you know, substitute in the uh, result in, into this place in uh, whether it's the pipe, you know, whether it's the stage, stages configuration or into a Kubernetes manifest. If an expression can't be evaluated, Spinnaker simply returns the text of the if the expression fails it will fail your pipeline overall. Expressions cannot be nested within other expressions. It's another point of confusion. Um, 
It's uh, not necessarily called out in all the documentation well, but I have tested this multiple times and tried many times myself. You can't put a you know dollar sign open close curly brace inside of another one and, and look for Spinnaker to compile that for you. Uh, like I said and mentioned earlier, you know you can use an expression in any text field, uh, with the one exception being at the very beginning of a pipeline in the pipeline configuration. Uh, and if a text field is not available, just open up the edit as JSON feature and use the uh, pipeline expression right there in the raw. Expressions on page with the exception of that pipeline configuration, like I mentioned. So as you can see over on the right, you, you uh, I've kind of laid out a little bit of an example, right? So you have a, an execution context, which is really just a JSON blob, with a bunch of information in it. You might see the type, which is going to be a pipeline. You see the ID for that particular pipeline that's executing. You'll see the application that's associated with it, the name. You know, you'll see an array of uh, stages, uh, an object with a bunch of information about what triggered it, and maybe a pipeline config ID. This is really truncated. There's more information in there, uh, but for the purposes of this uh, little example, you know, we'll we'll look at that and say, okay, well, maybe I want to return using Spring Expression language the name of this pipeline, and I would do that by writing a dollar sign open open curly brace execution dot name um, and then you know close that out and the result of that expression would be basic pipeline right because you can see the overall top level of this object is referred to as the execution and then mapping down dot name gets you to name and then you get basic pipeline so now that we've got a level set on geez what the heck is a pipeline expression for those of you who might be new um, we'll get into some advanced features, right? So we'll talk about defining a pipeline variable as a map, right? Uh, the syntax for this would be, you know, setting a variable name. And I've set this up to be a lot like the evaluate variable stage inside of Spinnaker where you get an input field for the variable name and then an input field for the variable value. So in this case, I might wanna say, well, really I want a, a map or an object that has a couple of key value pairs. Property one set at 100, property two set to true. In order to do that, you can see the syntax here, right? So my simple map would result when run in returning just that object, right? So it's a map or an object. Now the use case for doing this would be creating those predefined or hard-coded values within the pipeline for use with branching decisions and logic. I've leveraged uh, maps to kind of set strategies for traffic management whenever I'm uh, using the uh, canary annotation of the Nginx ingress controller. And so whenever I'm deploying to the dev environment, I might say, you know what, let's just uh, deploy it and move 50% of our traffic over um, uh, during the first you know, part of the rollout. You know, basically strategy one would be let's shift 50% of the traffic uh, and then let's shift 100% uh, of the traffic. Or strategy two would be really for you know production where I'm going to go 5% of the traffic, 15% of the traffic, 25% of the traffic, 50, and then 100, right? And so rather than have to hard code that into every stage, I set an evaluate variable stage, predefine uh, the various strategies I might want to use, and then based on the input of a pipeline parameter, whenever I choose to run my uh, pipeline, I would select the strategy and then the pipeline takes care of the rest. Now you can also define a pipeline variable as a list, right? Syntax is very similar to setting it as a map, right? So my simple list would be just uh, the same syntax, but instead of key value pairs, I just have values, right? So I have value one, value two, value three. The result of that uh, is again, an array or a list, okay? The use case is very similar here, right? You're just trying to set predefined or hard-coded values. Uh, kind of upstream at an evaluate variable stage, you're going to use that for branching and decision logic. Um, one of the ways that I have used uh, my, sim you know, like a, a list uh, variable inside the expression or inside the pipeline is setting whitelists and blacklists for, you know, kind of the next level of permission controls inside of a pipeline where Spinnaker does provide RBAC with fiat uh, at the application level, where you can basically define what users can access the application and what users can execute pipelines. 
if you use uh, this approach where you can, you can create a list of uh, authorized users who can, uh, who are allowed to continue a particular branch of a pipeline. So if you have a, a mono pipeline, a monolith pipeline that deploys to all three, um, all three environments uh, simultaneously, you could uh, instead, you could add a preconditions check to the uh, branch for production that basically says it has to be a user from this list that triggered the pipeline to even execute this part of the pipeline, right? So uh, lists can be very valuable whenever you're trying to add a little bit of uh, data validation on pipeline parameters, or if you're trying to, you know, kind of create that next level enhancement to um, access controls inside the pipeline itself. So the next feature that I tend to use uh, quite a bit is checking if a value is contained in the list. And this kind of gets to how I'm able to check execution context of every pipeline in the trigger element is the user that triggered it, right? So if I have a list of authorized users, I can check the user in the trigger context and then make sure that that's in the list. And if it is, it gives me a true. If it's not, it gives me a false, right? So the syntax here would, let's leverage that same simple list that I used before. I would say my simple list dot contains, and I'm looking for value number one. The result would be a true. Now, if I was looking for value four, remember I only had value one, value two, value three, this expression would actually return false, right? And so that's how I can create those white lists and black lists that I can then use in the logic of my pipeline branches. So like I said, use cases would be implementing more robust pipeline parameter validation, implementing finer grain whitelist and Blackman permissions and access controls within the pipeline itself, and then setting a variable for uh, use directly in a stage conditional on expression input. Now defining a pipeline variable as a result of a spell, you know, arithmetic. So you can do math. You can do pretty basic math. You can do additions, right? I use this a lot whenever I'm looping pipelines or really looping is a bad uh, word to use with it, right? It's really uh, recursion of the same pipeline over and over and over again through a certain number of iterations, right? And so in this case, I might say my next, you know, my variable is the next iteration where it takes the iteration count that was passed into the pipeline converts it into an integer, and then adds one, right? And there's kind of two different syntax. The raw spell syntax would be, you know, new integer parameters dot iteration count plus one. Or you can use the helper function that is be, uh, built into Spinnaker itself, where you can just say hashtag new or pound new int, and then pass in the string. It's important because all, all values defined in um, whether through the evaluate variables or through the pipeline parameters actually get carried through the context as strings until you convert them into integers, right? So in this scenario, the iteration count would be set to one. And when I run this, the result would be two. And the result's actually an integer uh, coming out of the um, math equation. So use cases, tracking the number of times a subordinate pipeline has been run during a self-looping iteration, incrementing a version number when manually versioning services or other Kubernetes resources. So another great feature is checking the length of a map or a list. So the syntax for this would be a variable name, a variable value set to my simple list size. And the expression for that is, again, using that my simple list that had three values in it, value one, value two, value three. When I run that search or run that, that expression, the result would be a count of three. And that is a type of an integer. So the use cases here is really, I use this a lot for determining if the previous stage has failed, right? Um, and you could do that by combining not only the you know check of the length of the map, but also with a map filter. So a little bit more complex, but I would be looking at execution.stages filtered down to any stages that have a status of failed underscore continue. 
so in this in this scenario, I would have pipelines that don't hard fail when a stage fails. It actually fails continue. So like ignore the failure, continue on. And then all subsequent stages would check and say, is there any failures using that map filter? Check the size. If it comes back zero, I can run. If it comes back greater than zero, I'm not allowed to run. I'm not going to run mine. I'm going to move on. And then all the subsequent stages would just um, you know, fail to execute and continue all the way till the end when I would hold it for a review. So using regular expressions to match property value, uh, little known feature, but you can use regular expressions. So in this case, I'm sending a variable name of regex result and uh, the variable value would be an expression where I'm looking for a property that matches uh, failure or the, the string F-A-I-L. Um, case you gotta be aware of whenever you're using the regular expression syntax to spell is that you have to match the entire string, right? So if you're looking to match on a partial of the string that, that would be contained inside of that uh, context element, you actually have to begin the expression with a period followed by an asterisk and end it with a period followed by an asterisk. So the use case here would be determining if any previous stage failed regardless of the type of failure, right? So taking that same syntax from before where I was filtering the execution stages, instead of looking for a strict match on failed underscore continue, I would be looking for a status that matches uh, any string that contains fail uh, followed by any characters afterwards, right? And then check the size. So let's work through a few examples, right? And um, each of these examples leverages an element of, or several elements of what we just walked through. So let me move over to my spinnaker and I've got uh, really two examples, but three pipelines to walk through. We'll start with that first one about you know, failing stages, but not hard failing them and, you know, failing them and continuing them. Uh, this really came out of a use case from one of our customers uh, that was looking to prevent further pipeline executions if there was a failure on a previous execution, right? And so looking across uh, pipeline executions and Spinnaker is not really possible. Uh, you can you know, if a pipeline triggers another pipeline, you can pass in that execution context, but you're not actually searching two different execution contexts. You're just searching the previous execution context inside the new pipelines context, right? So if you don't wanna do that, how do you make sure that no subsequent pipelines continue to proceed, continue to execute if, if uh, the previous one failed? Well, you do that by structuring a pipeline First and foremost, using the execution option to disable concurrent pipeline executions. So that makes sure that only one can run at a time. So now that we, we can make it so that only one runs at a time, how do we keep one running, right? So if we let a, a stage fail hard, the pipeline will actually stop running and the next execution will, will run, right? Um, so we have to figure out some way to basically pause the execution, um, but not with human intervention, right? We don't want to put a manual judgment stage at the end of every one of these deployments and make somebody have to go in and look to make sure that that, that stage completed move, move through. That kind of defeats the entire philosophy of Spinnaker, which is continuous automated you know, deployment, right? So uh, by using this, uh, this configuration point in the config, I then have set up three develop, uh, deployment stages. Now for the purposes of uh, demonstration, I'm not actually gonna deploy to Kubernetes. These, while I've named them deployment stages, they're actually wait stages, right? So we have a stage here that's just gonna hold for five seconds just to kind of show that Spinnaker would be taking an action. Uh, the next one, it's not actually a wait, it's a conditional, right? And this is where uh, based on my pipeline parameter, I'm gonna trick Spinnaker into thinking that a failure occurred. Right. And when the failure occurs, what I want to have happen is I want deployment, the subsequent stage of deployment three, which is another way, I want that to be skipped. Right. And I want that to skip because there was a previous failure. And then I want the pipeline to hold with a manual judgment for review. 
when a manual judgment is waiting for review, that pipeline is still running. And when that pipeline's running, it's preventing all the previous ones from executing, right? So with this pipeline containing a failure, manual judgment kicks off, but I only want it to kick off when there's a failure, right? So deployment two would only execute uh, if uh, my pipeline parameter that I pass in, which is a force failure, is true. So really, let's take a look at deployment number three. It's only going to execute if the result of that, uh, you know, map filter size judgment uh, or expression comes back as zero. So if that returns zero, I can execute. That's great. We'll see that wait take place. If that, you know, deployment two, that force failure, that little tricking, tricking I'm doing, uh, comes back with a fail continue, the size of that will be greater than zero. Deployment three will not kick off. Now, when we go and look at the pipeline contains a failure manual judgment, this only runs if we do have previous failures. So the deployment stages are saying only run if there are no failures. This manual judgment stage only runs if there are failures, right? Now, the issue here is I still want this pipeline to show as failed, even if somebody says, okay, continue this manual judgment, it's successful. So I have a final stage here that basically says, hey, if there's any failure, force fail, right? So when we run through this pipeline execution, let me go ahead and expand this out. We'll start this judgment and we'll see what it looks like whenever we don't force a failure. I'm gonna go ahead and run it. We'll see deployment number one is running, wait time of five seconds. Now that deployment number two that has no wait time, it just ran. Now we're on deployment number three, right? It's doing its wait, it succeeded, and you can see that the pipeline containing failures manual judgment hold didn't run, right? And now the force failure of a pipeline doesn't run either. Okay, so let's see what happens whenever I try to run two pipelines. So this one, we will force a failure. Select true. And then I'm going to run another one where I'm going to say force false. So now, because I have that, that configuration point set that says you can't run concurrent pipelines, this one's not started. It's waiting on a running execution. I have a failure. I forced that failure. Deployment two failed, in air quotes. And so now I'm at that manual judgment that's holding it. So it doesn't matter how many pipeline executions stack up, they're going to wait until the ops team goes and investigates why the failure occurred, clears out this, whether continuing or stopping doesn't matter, right? And then the next executions would proceed, okay? So that's how you can use pipeline expressions to really do a, um, you know, preventing of further deployments and holding a pipeline execution if any stage fails. And I would say that uh, after figuring out, you know, this model, probably about half the pipelines I help customers uh, um, design involve this kind of pass through failure and, you know, conditional execution. That way you can get to the end. If there is a failure, you could have a branch that actually cleans up the previous resources, right? So it's not just go and figure out what the problem was and acknowledge the issue but now build into the pipeline the ability to say, acknowledge and run uh, the cleanup, at which point it would undo everything and then the next execution would start up. So I'll go ahead and stop that. And I'm gonna go ahead and cancel this execution. All right, so let's talk about loops, right? And how you can use them or really pipeline recursion, okay? starts to get a little complex. One of the challenges of Spinnaker is really the way in which uh, organizations learn how to use Spinnaker. If you look at a lot of the documentation that's out there, you'll see uh, pipeline examples that are one big pipeline, right? And so if you're gonna deploy to multiple environments or you're gonna deploy to multiple regions, do everything within one single pipeline context, right? And so now you have multiple branches and with multiple branches comes multiple increased risk of failure 
uh, not just because of Spinnaker. I mean, things could break in Spinnaker, but also, you know, you could have uh, the big backhoe in the sky cut the uh, the fiber cable to the region, at which point, you know, it, it fails uh, for a reason outside of Spinnaker. Uh, the best thing to do is break up your pipelines, especially when they start to get large into multiple pipelines. It helps uh, with uh, reusability. It also helps with uh, Spinnaker itself because when you get up over 45 stages, the UI elements of deck that render the pipeline, uh, whenever you go and look at you know, the pipeline itself that shows you the status, where you see the execution details, you can see the pipeline, you get up over 45, deck really struggles to show all of them, right? And so I've seen customers with hundreds of stages and then they start to wonder why uh, they can't really get in to edit them anymore, right? They have to actually go edit the, uh, the JSON instead. Um, best thing to do is break things up, right? When you break things up, starts to open up the door for doing things like loops. So here's a basic structure of how a loop works, right? In my configuration, I've set a couple of pipeline parameters, right? I have a limit on the number of times I'm gonna loop, and then I have an iteration count, right? So the first time I call this loop, I would be on iteration number one, and maybe I have a limit of five. Right, so I want to loop through this pipeline five times and, and run some set of stages. Right, with those parameters set, the first thing I tend to do in most of my pipelines is evaluate variables. Even though I can still access things directly as parameters, the the more you, the further you get into a pipeline, the harder it is to keep track of what variable was set when, and you run the risk of overwriting variables in the future. Right, so if you know you need certain variables. And they're coming in through parameters. I always just evaluate variable stages at the very beginning, get those variables evaluated, then use them as you need to, right? So in this case, what I really want to do is calculate what's my next iteration, what's my current iteration, and what's my limit, right? So in the previous, in my test run I did before training, I passed in two. It knows that, so the limit is two, it knows that its current iteration is three, and it knows that its next iteration is four. The last run I did, it was on the final loop of the pipeline. And so it knows, hey, I'm greater than two, so I'm going to not continue looping. So like I said, now I'm going to evaluate, is the current iteration less than or equal to the limit? If it is, I need to keep looping, right? And so here at this continue looping, I have a manual judgment. It's at this point in this pipeline that I would build in all the stages that I need to do multiple times over and over and over again. Maybe I need to deploy to three or four regions. The deployment logic for each of those regions or for deploying to a region would be built in here. And I would pass in a, a pipeline parameter that actually defines what region I'm going to. And that would get substituted into this logic. Now, if we're on a iteration that is greater than the limit, then hey, I'm done, right? So the looping is complete. I'm on a different branch, right? Now, for the basics of, or the basis of control, I have a manual judgment here just to, to kind of help display the functionality as well as we walk through the loops, right? Now let's jump back down to the continue looping stage. After I run all of my logic, let's say I've got five stages here, it knows I need to do more looping. So run, run the logic and then rerun the pipeline. Now there's a nuance here. I can't actually select my pipeline using, um, I can't select my pipeline using the run as pipeline stage, right? So whenever I come up here, I've got a stage name. I've got, let me add a stage here and say run pipeline. So if I pick a pipeline stage is what, what I have down here under the rerun pipeline. Let me remove it, get it back down. So this is a run pipeline stage. My only option is pipelines, not the current pipeline. But like I said earlier, you can always edit a text field straight into JSON. So whenever I come into edit stages JSON, you'll see the pipeline ID that needs to run. So in order to run, have a pipeline rerun itself, you come up here to the browser, you select your pipeline ID, you copy and paste it into here, and then you can define your pipeline parameters either in the JSON 
Uh, well, actually, you'll have to do it in the pipe in the JSON because the UI won't actually render it, right? One of the keys is you want to wait for the results, right? So you want these things to kind of stack up as they're waiting for the the, the pipeline that it called to run uh, runs, and then as they complete, it'll pass back up through uh, the pipeline structure. Okay, so that's what happens whenever it reruns. It'll rerun itself. It'll pass in. The, the next iteration, it'll also pass in the limit, right? And so now you've just got this recursion going that's gonna run through until it hits its limit. When it hits its limit, it's gonna basically say, hey, I'm done and pass back up. When I say pass back up, it's because you really have to have a master pipeline to run loops, okay? So when I look at this master pipeline, it's pretty simple, right? I've got some query parameters. I'm going to pass in my how many times I want to run my first loop. I'm going to run in. I'm going to pass in how many times I want to run my second loop. Okay. Now my first loop is going to run. I'm going to you know run a pipeline and I'm going to pass in. So you can see I'm calling using recursion to loop a pipeline. The loop itself, my iteration number, which is always going to be one for the first time I start it, and I'm going to pass in my limit, which I'm calling the parameters dot first loop parameter. Okay, now for my second loop, I'm passing in a one and I'm passing in my second parameter. Just like with the loops, I'm actually wait, uh, I'm doing the same thing in the master where I'm waiting for the results to propagate back up. Okay, so we have a couple of manual judgments built into the loops themselves and we have a manual judgment at the end to, to see if it's successful. So let me go ahead and kick this off. I'm going to start a manual execution of my master. I'm going to go ahead and loop each of these pipelines twice. So let's run it. And now I'm going to change my view to none. So you can see here, down, down here in the second listing, you can see the master itself. It's running, right? It initiated its first loop. It's evaluated the variables, knows it needs more looping. The branch that is looping complete is not running, right? So it's grayed out. And so I'm at my manual judgment. Let's continue my looping. So it's gonna go ahead and loop. It starts rerunning itself. A new execution runs. It knows it needs more looping because, hey, I'm on the, I'm less than or equal to my limit. So now I'm at that logic point. So if I had five stages here, they would run uh, in a series or maybe in branches. Um, Let's go ahead and continue looping. But I want you to pay attention to what's kind of going on here. We have a rerun of the pipeline waiting, and we have a waiting, and we have the master waiting. So you can kind of see these things are taking place. I'm not sure if I called it out, but the loop itself would also need to allow uh, concurrent execution. So we didn't use the prevent concurrent executions pipeline parameter uh, or execution config. So now I called for two, a third one runs. The third one runs because I need a loop to resolve. And so I need that branch for the, you know, no more looping needed to run. And so you can see here, more looping needed doesn't run. Looping complete does. Holds for a manual judgment just for the purposes of display. Let's continue it. Now it knows, hey, I'm passing up some parameter variables. And now you can see that one completed. The one that called it is now going to complete, right? Because it's getting the context. It completed. And now the next one is going to get it. So it's kind of bubbling up through all the pipelines that called it all the way back up to the master. And so the master is going to see that. And now it's going to move to its second loop iteration and start the process over again. So let's continue it. Rerunning the pipeline. Let's continue again, rerunning the pipeline. Oh, looping is complete because we set it to two. It's on its third one, knows, hey, I'm done. Let's complete, our, let's complete our pipeline. It's gonna pass up. It's gonna be received. The next one's gonna receive it. And now the master is going to say, hey, I'm going to get notified that that second loop is done, so I'm going to continue on. Were we successful? Yes, we were. 
And that is how you work through a looping recursion with a uh, master pipeline structure. Each of those stages is using some element of uh, the spring expression language that I called out in that presentation, right? Now, when I talk about executions kind of bubbling up through, uh, you know, from pipeline to pipeline back up to that master, you, you, there's two ways, there's kind of two outcomes of pipeline uh, content. Another pipeline. When when pipeline A triggers pipeline B, the entire execution context, everything in the execution details from pipeline A gets passed into pipeline B inside of the trigger element of the execution context. Whenever a pipeline calls another pipeline, waits for the results, and it receives the results, it doesn't get the entire context. It gets the out details of the context. So let's go ahead and walk through what that looks like. And I'm going to jump over to a little tester that I have, a little, a little build tester. And let's come over here and pick our pipeline. We pick the spell workshop, pick our master loop, and the one from four minutes ago. So here's the whole pipeline execution context, we know we ran three stages, loop number one, loop number two, and then the final, was I successful? So if I expand this out and go to the outputs, you'll see that all the parameters that were passed up to it from the last loop, uh, which bubbled up from the final, the final run of the loop itself, kind of come up. So any variable you define using an evaluate variable stage in a pipeline that is run by another pipeline that waits on its results, becomes accessible in the top level master pipelines uh, stages outputs. It also has a limited amount of context from that pipeline. It has the pipeline ID, um, the execution ID. It also gives you the name of the execution, the application, and then whatever parameters were passed in, right? So that's all accessible in the context. It's not the entire thing, but if you were to get any artifacts out of that or any evaluated variables, those all come up as outputs. Now, why did I talk about loops? Why did I talk about fail through? Um, let's jump back over to the presentation. It's really come working demonstration of this, but it's really difficult to see kind of what's going on, especially when you, you have to understand the the stages and kind of what's going on uh, throughout the flow of the pipeline. So I'll just sort of walk through uh, the pattern in a presentation, okay? Um, so this particular Spinnaker pipeline pattern is a progressive blue-green canary deployment where that canary gets promoted to production, right? In order to do this, there's a couple of uh, uh, advanced features that I'm using. Uh, not only of Spinnaker, but also of the Nginx Ingress controller. So I'm using a deployment Kubernetes object type, um, which is not versioned by Spinnaker. Uh, I can tell Spinnaker to version that deployment using an annotation, uh, a Spinnaker annotation that is basically saying, hey, set the strategy for versioning to true, right? So now Spinnaker is going to version every deployment and basically treat it a little bit like a replica set. With the Nginx Ingress controller, I am controlling the traffic shift where I deploy two of the exact same ingress, uh, the Kubernetes ingresses, one that has a canary annotation on it and one that does not, right? And then like I talked about, you can kind of define what your strategy is for the traffic shift I would then iterate over and using a, a loop to shift that traffic from the canary deployment over or from the production deployment to the canary and then i would go in and edit my uh canary ingress to make it production right and so the pipeline itself in green you would see all the pipelines that would be getting used you'd have a top level pipeline which is really initiate that rollout to production uh which would have these stages and in green inside of that you would see subsequent like uh 
subordinate pipelines that have their own stages running in it uh, that would then accomplish the entire concept of blue-green canary deployment with promotion of that canary to, canary to production. So inside the, the top level, I would basically say, is this an initial rollout or is it a, a follow-on rollout? If it's an initial, check that. And you know what, go ahead and just roll out the resources. If it's a follow-on rollout, now I wanna do that blue-green deployment, right? So this won't run. Subsequently, the second pipeline, the actual complex pipeline would run or a branch would run. And so I'm gonna run a rollout of the blue-green canary resources themselves. The master pipeline is gonna wait on those results, right? I might throw a manual judgment here in just when I'm starting to, uh, use this pipeline and, and get comfortable with it, but you don't need a you don't need a, a manual judgment there. You can just let the canary traffic shift loop start. I might, you know, for the purposes of what a canary really is, which is, you know, that incremental shift, that that you know, human validation or machine validation if, if you're actually using canary metrics to determine should I continue the loop. So whether I'm beginning that's gonna, you know, run some analysis and check it. Or I might have a manual judgment where a human's actually going to go look and say, do I think everything's good? I would put those, those two stages at the beginning of the canary loop. So the canary loop would immediately start off, run its, its process to do the first iteration of the traffic shift. It would see, I need to do more traffic shifting, so I'm going to call myself again, right? And I'm going to hold, or I'm going to go ahead and run that canary metric at 10%. And then it's going to say, hey, I know I'm not at 100, so let's keep on rolling. So I might end up stacking two traffic shift loops, or I might end up stacking 10. It all depends on the strategies I define as part of this app's rollout, right? Once the canary are looping needed, all of those uh, pipelines are going to complete. It's going to bubble all the way up to the master pipeline that was running that loop itself. And then it's going to move forward, right? I might throw a manual judgment and a condition check to basically say, hey, all traffic shifted, do you want to clean up? Or after everything was shifted, did all of a sudden a bunch of com complaints come in about this app, do I need to roll back? And so using you know, the spell expressions inside of this logic, I can not only promote that canary to prod, but I can also roll everything back. And so passing in parameters, I can, uh, have a rollback of the canary or a cleanup of the, the deployment pipeline that accepts parameters that just goes and cleans up the services by name or the deployments by name. And it's not hard coded specifically to that uh, particular uh, application and deployment, and which becomes important when you're using that versioning strategy of Spinnaker because the actual deployment name has a version number uh, added in as a suffix to the name itself, right? So having those pipelines run with kind of a, a dynamic injection of the data using pipeline expressions is very, very valuable. But that's the end of the presentation and walkthroughs. Um, is there any questions?